Drive brings us to the second episode of Season 6. During the Season 5-6 to six summer hiatus is when the X-Files movie, Fight the Future, came out. And Episode 1 of Season 6 sort of built off of that. Drive, then, is the first to break from the mythology and get back to sort of normal, for the sliding scale that that applies to the X-Files, and also was thus at a time when the show was still strong enough that they felt they could make a movie about it. It starts with something that I admit caught me off guard for a moment, with the opening of a high-speed chase that looked like it was an emergency break into the programming. Uh, We actually have a Fox 11 here in Wisconsin, see. It didn't last long, obviously. The station call letters made that clear, but it was a pretty effective means of catching the viewer off guard. It soon transitions to normal filming, though, as we see that a disheveled man has a woman lying in the back of his car, soon accompanied by an annoying ringing sound. Well, if that's bothering you, lady, things are going to get worse when you hit the spike strips. He's dragged out and she gets carried away, much to his horror. It's always difficult parting ways with your hostage. Soon she's hitting her head against the window of the squad car, though, and finally there's this blood spray. And not like she popped a boil doing that either. This is this is a job that's going to require the hose. After the The Truth is Out There, we pick up with Mulder and Scully at a farmer's house. It's hard to remember, but back in the second half of the 90s, in the wake of the Oklahoma City bombing, the terrorism on people's minds was domestic, with the specter of communism no longer looming and the attack on the Twin Towers still years away. So the expected enemy of America was believed to be a homegrown one. And so primitive explosive devices were considered a high enough priority for Mulder and Scully to travel around making sure that no one was making bombs out of their fertilizer. While Scully is helping the farmer look for his paperwork, Mulder spots the news story on the nearby TV, and he is intrigued. He wants to go and check it out on the grounds that it's more interesting than their bullshit assignment. Thank you, thank you. But Scully says that all they can do is keep their heads down until they can get back to working on X-Files cases again, instead of this punishment detail. But this is an X-File practically in their neighborhood. Come on, Scully, Mulder is jonesing for one. It's a wonder he hasn't tossed a pie pan himself. We find our driver in a jail cell, nose bleeding, ears ringing, pleading for help. Probably like a lot of people who wind up in there, it's just usually they've been drinking first. His name is Crump, a 40-year-old roofer with no history of crime or mental illness, so it's inexplicable why one day he'd steal someone's car and take his wife on a high-speed chase across the state line into Nevada. So Scully goes to check out the remains of the wife, finding a clear sign of an exit wound, but absolutely no evidence of an entry wound or any other sign of a bullet. It's almost like a little bomb went off in her ear. We'll have to look for a tiny truck full of fertilizer to ensure this doesn't happen again. As for Crump, he's so bad that they're rushing him to the hospital. But as they drive west, he starts doing better. So much better that he pulls out one of the deputy's guns and stops the ambulance, taking Mulder hostage. Scully calls to say that someone else was found in a similar state to the wife back near their place, so she thinks that there's some kind of infection. So... Don't have any contact with Crump Mulder. Drive. I suppose there's no chance that you've been social distancing. He threatens to kill Mulder if the cops don't back off, so they do, for right now. Shoot people. Fingers. That's right, he's a conspiracy theorist, more than Mulder. Hey Mulder, how's it feel not to be the craziest guy in the room? Mulder realizes that there is something wrong with Crump. I mean, besides acting nuttier than an accident involving a planter's truck, and being named Crump for that matter. When he stops moving, Crump gets worse, and when he is moving, Crump gets better. But Mulder says that that won't be for long with a roadblock up ahead. And Crump can't do anything because in his temporary madness, he tossed Mulder's phone out the window. Scully probably wishes she could do that right now. Excuse me. Scully. Agent Scully, please hold for Assistant Director Kirsch. Oh yeah, it's the new boss. Here to remind you you're supposed to be investigating a great big pile of crap in Idaho. Not a great big pile of crap in Nevada. Jurisdiction, bitches. 
Meanwhile, in the car... Mr. Crump. Call me by my last name. You say Mr. in front of it. I can't. Mr. Crump sounds like a villain in an animated Christmas special. Crump is continuing to alienate the only man in this car, including a speculation that Mulder is Jewish. It's Mr. Mulder to you, you peanut-picking bastard. The intention with the character of Crump was that he was supposed to, on the one hand, be unlikable, like picking right now to reveal that you're an anti-Semite, but also to try to get the audience to sympathize with him despite that, that he may not be the picture-perfect victim, but that that doesn't mean that he deserves to have a bomb go off in his ear. This, obviously, is Brian Cranston, and the writer of the episode is Vince Gilligan. I probably don't have to tell you that the two collaborated on one of the biggest dramas of the last 20 years, Breaking Bad, and in a way, this episode contributed substantially to that. Gillian says that his work on the X-Files helped him immensely in learning how to run a series by watching Chris Carter at work. And this episode in particular stood out because, like with Crump, the character of Walter White was supposed to both have your sympathy even though he is descending into an unlikable man. There are conflicting stories about how the casting for this actually went. Some have been saying that Gillian always wrote the part with Cranston in mind. But what seems more likely based upon interviews with Gilligan is that what actually happened was Cranston was told to uh, audition for this part by mistake. But when he came in there having prepared to do Crump, he was just indulged to uh, get the chance to audition for that role instead. Gilligan then said after the performance, OTW, which means off to wardrobe. It means that this is the actor that is definitely meant to play this role. He says he had never heard of Cranston before. This was before Malcolm in the Middle came out. And so he came in there knowing nothing about his abilities as an actor, but being amazed by the fact that he could say these vile things and yet still have some whispers of humanity to him, which was what was so vital for the character. This actually was vital to the development of Breaking Bad because AMC was really nervous about taking the dad from Malcolm in the Middle and making him the head of this drug empire. This episode was what put their mind at ease. Meanwhile, Scully still thinks this is a disease, even though the CDC has come up empty. They're checking out the Crump estate, full hazmat and all that, and they find the dog is going absolutely nuts. It's running around on its chain, barking and yelping. What they don't know is that Mulder has figured out not only is it movement that's needed, but movement in a westward direction. When you move west, the problem subsides. So when they grab the dog and hold it down to get a blood sample... <laughs> got the sample! Mulder is understandably curious about what the fuck is going on here, so Crump explains that he stayed home since he's a roofer and it was raining, but that's when his wife's nose started bleeding and then she began complaining of a headache. When she started screaming, he got her into the car to take her to the hospital, which is how he discovered what made it better and worse. But this is when he starts going off on conspiracy theories with a heavy dose of anti-Semitism to differentiate it from Mulder's conspiracy theories. Mulder may be nuts, but he's equal opportunity nuts. He doesn't start hurling anti-gay slurs at ghosts or something. Meanwhile, Scully discovers that the Crumps have a neighbor, and upon arriving, they find a dead parakeet, a pathogen that kills humans, dogs, and birds. Pretty rare. Bullets may have been ruled out, but they'd still be my number one suspect. Searching the place finds the remains of an old woman. Oh, sorry, it looks like the decision desk called that one a little early. Her words make clear that this woman is deaf, backed up by the closed caption on the screen. So while Scully tries to calm down someone wondering why the bad guys from E.T. have broken into her house, Mulder has to deal with a little problem that this car does not run on racism. So he tries to fill it up. But Crump can't wait long enough for Mulder to go inside and prepay for gas because the station is afraid of people driving off. Back to the drawing board. Mulder didn't just leave his car, though. He left a note saying about this going west thing and that they need to not put up any roadblocks. 
The sheriff passes it along to Scully, who is in the middle of investigating a bunch of dead birds, leading her to something stamped government property. Crump was ranting about government spooks wandering around his woods. I'd just written it off because he was also talking about putting radiation into kids' gonads. Crump also tries to apologize for saying that stuff about the Jews earlier, saying that Mulder didn't choose to be born Jewish after all, so he's really coming around, isn't he? Why are you doing this? Why am I doing what? This. It's not your best interest to make me question that right now. While Mulder tries to think of reasons besides all life is precious, even that of an asshole, let's check in with Scully. She's visiting the Naval Research Station here in Nevada. Apparently someone really needed some votes in Nevada and didn't even want to pretend that they weren't buying them. Later we're going to check in and see how things are going with the Kentucky Coal-Powered Time Machine Project. The naval officer on duty there thinks that Scully is here on behalf of the FCC because there was this technical glitch that morning with their ground communication radio. Project Seafarer is what it's called. Uh, you can see the big logo there. He can't give specifics because the project is classified, including the effects of the project on organisms. But Scully knows that extremely low-frequency radio waves like the ones that it uses can have effects on organisms. Plus, there's the fact that he said that the information about it is classified. They wouldn't classify information that says that this thing isn't going to hurt anybody, right? They would only do it the other way. There's no bureaucrat somewhere going, classify the hell out of that. The last thing we want is for anyone to know that our secret communication system is absolutely and totally harmless. We want people to think there's a definite chance that it could fuck them up. Well, we need to get Mulder back up to speed on what's going on. So a uh, California Highway Patrolman delivers a cell phone so that she can fill Mulder in. Project Seafarer is an actual thing, by the way. It's meant to send messages to submarines because normal radio waves cannot penetrate to the depths. So uh, it doesn't matter, though, because improvements in technology have made this unnecessary. It was shut down about six years after this episode aired, actually. No word on whether or not anyone in a trailer park having an exploding head had anything to do with that decision, though. Scully has a plan, but there is some risk. They're going to fly ahead and meet Mulder and Crump on the Pacific shore, where there's no more west as an option unless you want to get him a speedboat. I mean, we have one, but the Navy keeps that in Nebraska. Scully will then try to use a needle to draw out the fluid in his ear to relieve the pressure before Crump's head shatters. Except, there's no time to even try. Even at the car's top speed, Mulder can't drive fast enough for Crump. He's dead on arrival. And to add a cherry on top, when they return to Washington, the boss begins reading off an itemized list for their expenses for this unauthorized detour. And after Mulder finally storms off, the boss makes clear that whatever the results of what they did, he does not care. Stick with the crap work you've been given and maybe you'll get back to being kidnapped by aliens again. Well, since this is not a mythology episode, it's unimportant, but I'm still giving this a stamp of strongly recommended. It moves surprisingly well, and Cranston and Duchovny provide a great double act. The script, as usual, showcases Vince Gilligan's great writing skills, with some nice zingers in there. Much like another episode of his that we looked at, Hungry, it does a good job of playing with where our sympathies should lie, rather than sticking to the straightforward techniques that television writers will usually employ. If Breaking Bad first sprouted here, then it was a seed well planted. Though Mulder and Scully may have to investigate the fertilizer first. I can see to drive. My eyes are tearing up so bad. <laughs> 